The story of the Garden of Eden is a complex story layered with themes, ideas, images, and addresses fundamental questions about human life, God's creation, sexuality, and our relationship to God. It's this richness that has led to the multifaceted contributions this story has made to theology and culture. Before we get started, I want to ask you a question. How would you explain something you have never seen or heard of before to someone else? Let's say you had a vision of a distant world. How would you convey that to someone else, what it was like? Well, you would have to use terms, ideas, and concepts that you are already familiar with. You would have to start with what is known to explain the unknown. This is where metaphors and analogies come into play. We do this all the time. For example, when portable computers were invented, we used the word laptop to explain them. But they're not laptops. This is a lap in the top of it. Or what about chips? You know, those little things that are in computers. They're not really chips, but we're using a word we're familiar with, like a little chip, and then we can use that to understand, speak about these thin silicon wafers that are loaded with millions of microtransistors. The same is true in the Bible. When the authors were referring to visions or times or places they had never seen or been to before, nor had their audience been there, they needed to use images and metaphors to explain what it was like there based on what they already know. Let's see how this plays out in Genesis 2 and 3 and the story of the Garden of Eden. How does the author convey what that garden was like and what happened there? Remember, this story was very historically distant from the people that the author is writing to, and it occurs in a place that no longer exists, according to Genesis. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to dive a little bit deeper into the biblical text and at the same time help equip you to read the Bible in a more engaged manner. So if you like this channel and this content, please consider subscribing and give it a big thumbs up as well. In last week's video, I looked at how Genesis chapter 2 verses 4 through 7 and then the end of chapter 3 form bookends to the story of the Garden of Eden. And these bookends not only serve to introduce the main themes of the story, they set the reader up also for the tragic consequences in the fall of humanity in this story. Now I don't have time to go into much more detail about that, but if you like, you can take a look at my video on that topic that I posted last week. So let's take a look at the beginning of the story of the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 2.8, it says, The Lord God planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he placed the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees to grow from the soil, every tree that was pleasing to look at and good for food. Now the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil were in the middle of this orchard. And also notice, just by the way, how this mention of the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is setting us up for what's going to happen towards the end of this story. The first thing we know is something about where this garden is placed. Geographically, we have no idea where it is. There's been a lot of speculations to this, but remember, when the flood occurs, all these geographic markers that we might have are going to be wiped out. So we really don't know where this garden is, except for probably somewhere in the Middle Eastern region. The one thing we do know is that this garden is planted in the land of Eden. It's not the garden of Eden, but the garden in Eden. The Hebrew word that we translate as Eden here has two possible meanings. It might be derived from the old Akkadian, Edenu, meaning plain or step. Others think that is related to the basic meaning of the word delight. When the Hebrew of Genesis 3.23 was translated into Greek, instead of using the Garden of Eden, they used the Paradise Tes Trephes, or the Garden of Delights, or the Garden of Luxury. During the period of the early church, when Genesis was translated into Latin, they used the phrase Paradisium 
volaptatis, or the garden of pleasure. So you see how the Greek and the Latin translators really thought Eden meant delight or pleasure. Whether we go with plain or with pleasure, the land of the Eden is described as a land that has four major rivers in it. It is loaded with precious stones and gold, and it is definitely portrayed in a manner to evoke the idea that God's blessing and beauty rests upon this land and is reflected in it. But what about this garden in Eden? From our perspective today, this garden is often portrayed as sort of a primordial, lush, very, very fertile forest. And it has been depicted that way for probably around the last 300 years in artwork as well. But is that how the ancient Jewish readers would have understood this garden? In order to answer that question, I'm going to use a linguistic tool called frame analysis. It sounds like a really fancy and high fluting idea, but a frame is really just how we talk in a particular situation. We use them all the time and you already know how to use and work with them, but you've probably never heard them referred to as a frame before. So let me give you an example. If I say, can I take a look at the menu? You already have a guess at what I'm talking about. Most likely you're thinking about being in a restaurant and one person is hogging the menu and I'm asking if I could take a look at it as well. But to be really sure, you would need to know the context in which I'm using it. In this case, the context would be the frame of eating in a restaurant. When you eat in a restaurant, you enter by the door, you're greeted, the host shows you to your table, hands you a menu, after placing your order from something on the menu, you sit, you sit around, talk for a bit, you eat, then you get up and you leave, and you make some kind of payment for the meal, and often a tip for the waiter. All those ideas are all part of the frame of eating in a restaurant. And this frame provides the meaning for the word menu when I say, can I take a look at the menu, please? But what if we change the frame a little bit? Suppose we go into a fast food restaurant instead. Now we may not be greeted. We're not seated at a table by our host, but we pick one out our own and we go up to the counter to order. And the menu is on the wall behind the cash register, not a paper menu that the host hands us and that we order off of when the waiter comes to us. Or let's change it a little bit more. What if we're at your office? and you're having problems with your computer and you ask me if I can help you. When I say, can I take a look at the menu? Now I'm asking a question to see what your computer is doing and what options are available on the computer at that time. The word menu means something completely different in each frame. So what is the frame in the story of the Garden of Eden? Now the text gives us a lot of clues to figure out what the appropriate frame for this story is. Just like we would like to know what type of menu someone was asking to look at, in this context we need to figure out what type of garden is the author talking about here. Now there are four very big clues in this story that help us grasp what type of garden this was. Notice a great deal of attention is given to the water, that there are four rivers there. Second, the only vegetation that is mentioned in this entire garden are trees. Third, there seems to be some sort of wall around it because when Adam and Eve are cast out at the end of chapter 3, there is an angel that is stationed at the entrance on the east side to prevent them from coming back in. And the implication is there is that they can't get in any other way because there is probably some sort of barrier around it. And finally, it talks about when God comes walking in the cool of the day in Genesis 3.8. All of these help us understand what this garden is and what kind of frame we're talking about here. The Hebrew word that's translated as garden in 2.8 is gan in Hebrew. And this is a fairly generic term to refer to a garden in the Old Testament. So we need some context to understand what type of garden it's talking about. Oftentimes in the Old Testament, this word for Gan is used to refer to gardens of a king or a member of the royal family within the Old Testament. For example, in 2 Kings 
2118, it says that King Manasseh passed away and he was buried in his palace garden, the Garden of Uzzah. So you see that the king, Manasseh here, has a garden within his royal palaces. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon talks about the orchard or garden that is planted with pools of water. Ecclesiastes 2, 4 through 6. I increased my possessions. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I designed royal gardens and parks for myself. I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I constructed pools of water for myself to irrigate my grove of flourishing trees. Now notice all the parallels between this passage and Genesis 2. In the Song of Songs, the husband speaks metaphorically about his wife, describing her in terms of a garden. In Song of Songs 4.12, he says, You are a locked garden, my sister, my bride. You are an enclosed garden, a sealed up fountain. Your shoots are a royal garden full of pomegranates with choice fruits, henna with nard. You are a garden spring, a well of fresh water flowing down from Lebanon. And then finally 416. Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind, blow upon my garden. Let its spices flow. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat the choicest of fruits. Now, in that passage, he's using this idea of one of these rural gardens to describe the beauty of his wife. Throughout the ancient Near East, kings and other wealthy officials would have enclosed gardens at their houses. A bas relief from Ashurbanipal's palace in Assyria, which comes much later than the story of Genesis, by the way, shows the king and queen seated and being served in their garden, and you can see the trees in the background. There are also images from Egyptian tombs that give us a picture of what these gardens might have been like for an official within the royal household. These gardens were walled in, were places of luxury and rest, and relief from the outside world and heat. They primarily had a collection of trees, and there would have been a main water feature within them as well. Now in the Garden of Eden, we have every kind of fruit tree, and we have four great rivers. So this is not just a royal garden, this is God's royal garden or orchard. Now the Net Bible, when they translate this word in Genesis 2, instead of garden, they chose to use the word orchard instead mainly because this garden is described in terms of the trees and the fruit trees that are within it. While orchard captures the idea that this is a garden full of trees, we tend to think of orchards along the lines of sort of an apple orchard or a tree orchard today. It's an industrial agricultural uh, type thing, long lines of trees all the way down. I think a better translation would be something along the lines that involves both garden and orchard maybe a walled garden or an enclosed garden that was planted with trees. But I really don't have a great one word term to translate this. It's also important to note that when Genesis 2 was translated into Greek, they used the word paradise for the Hebrew word garden. Now this Greek term was actually adopted from the Persian word pardes, which refers to royal gardens. So as early as 2 to 300 BC, when the Old Testament was translated into Greek, this garden was viewed in terms of a royal garden, one of these enclosed gardens like Solomon describes. So what did the frame of an ancient garden slash orchard convey? First of all, the luxury of all the fruit trees conveyed fertility, wealth, goodness, and blessing. Second, the water feature conveyed life and blessings as well, especially in the arid Middle East. To have a water feature not only showed that the person was wealthy and powerful, but it would have cooled the garden in the middle of the Mideastern heat. Third, the fact that this garden is walled in would have conveyed the idea of protection and relief from the outside world. These enclosed gardens would have been places that the average person could only dream about. 
They conveyed wealth, blessing, abundance, and relief from the outside world. And I think this is what the author of Genesis chapter 2 is telling us. This garden exuded God's abundance, blessing, and protection. It was a very special place and a royal garden which God placed man in. There's another idea I want to hit on quickly within this passage. In Genesis 2, 7, it says, The Lord God formed man from the soil of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, in chapter 1, the text says God created humans, and the verb that's used there is bara. And I was talking about how that word is only used for God's creative actions. Here, the Hebrew word is yatsar, and it speaks about fashioning something according to a plan or a design. Often is used to speak about the work of an artist. For example, in Jeremiah 18, 2-4, it's used to talk about the work of a potter, yatsar. And this word for potter is derived from the verb yatsar, to form or design or pattern something. Arise and go down to the potter, Yatsar, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working with, at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, and it seemed good to the potter to do. God then compares his relationship to Israel with that of the potter to the clay. In verse 6 of Jeremiah chapter 18, it says, Behold, like clay in the potter's hand, so you are in my hand. And this idea of God as the potter that shapes human beings is one that's found in several places throughout the Old Testament. So in Genesis 2, 7 here, even though it doesn't say God is the potter, it's employing that image. God takes some of the dirt and he forms man out of it, just like a potter. And there's a couple ideas that come off this. First off, man is a creature like any other creature. He was taken from the dirt. He is not a fallen heavenly creature, but is part and parcel of creation. Second, just like we saw last week with the literary bookends to this chapter, this image also foreshadows the conclusion of the Garden of Eden story. Man is taken from the dirt in 2.7. And after the fall, he's going to have to painfully toil the dirt in order to eat it. And when he dies, he's going to return to the dirt in 319. God took man from the dirt, and to the dirt he will return. Now let's move forward a little bit. I want to pick up the story in 215. The Lord God took the man and placed him in the orchard in Eden to care for it and to maintain it. Then the Lord commanded the man... You may freely eat from the fruit of every tree in the orchard, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, I just want to consider this idea of God placing man in this orchard or garden. Now, I'm not going to look at the consequences of the fall here, but what I want to look at this idea here is that he placed him in the orchard to care for and to maintain it. And I'm reading the Net Bible translation here at this point. Some translators translate this as to care for and to maintain it, like the net. Some translate it as to work and to keep it, to fit the context of the passage a little bit better. Literally, man's task is to care for and to maintain the trees in the orchard. This is the purpose is placed in the garden. I mentioned how temples often had gardens associated with them. In Greek, Egyptian, and also in the Jewish temple as well, there are a lot of connotations to gardens within the temple. Oftentimes, the pillars or the posts within the temple would have sort of palm leaves or things like that carved around the top of them. You would have a water feature and various things like this. And even the temple is laid out, it's enclosed, just like the Garden of Eden. As a result, a lot of people see very strong connotations between the Garden of Eden and these verbs to care for and to maintain with the duties that God will then assign to the priests later on in the Pentateuch. Kasuta argues that these verbs, to care for and maintain, should be translated as to worship and obey. That man's life in the garden was that of worship and obedience. He was like a priest, not merely a worker in the garden or a keeper of the garden. 
Now I think at this point, I think he's mixing his metaphors a little bit. And we really need to stick with the rule of context, context, context. What is this author saying in this passage with these words? In this passage, it's about caring for and maintaining the trees or this orchard. But these same ideas are going to set up what's going to take place later on when God charges the people of Israel to keep and maintain the law. Hopefully by recovering a little bit of this ancient frame of what type of garden this author is talking about, this story becomes a little richer for you. Knowing something about the frame helps us to understand just how special this place was. When the author of Genesis wrote this story down, they had to use language that their audience was familiar with and would understand. The use of this word orchard or garden and the frame that it conveys helps the reader then and now understand just how special this place was. It truly was paradise on earth. So what went wrong then? Well, we're going to get to that next week. Until then, peace.